Hello, uh, this is my stream review. Uh, so yeah, today I wanted to talk a little bit about NeoVim as a PDE, and I'll get to explaining what I mean by PDE um, later, but first I'll just do sort of a little introduction about myself. So who am I? My name's TJ DeVries. Uh, that's my GitHub handle. I'm one of the NeoVim core members. I've been a core member for a few years. I've been working on NeoVim uh, just sort of generally, or at least like have at least been doing some sort of PR since probably like 2016-ish was probably my first, uh, first PR. It was a super great experience for me. It was the first open source project that I'd ever contributed to. And people were just super nice and super helpful. And I was just like this idiot college kid who didn't really know how to write code or like how to do anything. <laughs> uh, and they helped me like figure out like, okay, here's like some of the things you need to do to like run our tests and here's how you run, add new tests. And so um, I kind of fell in love with the community then. And I was already pretty uh, in love with NeoVim as an editor uh, at that point. Um, I also am the author of Telescope NVim, which is a somewhat popular fuzzy finder sort of like library for NeoVim. And I'll show off a little bit about that as some self-promotion. Of course, you can't do a talk without uh, tooting your own horn. I think that's the rules. Um, and then also some other interesting things is I, uh, I live stream on Twitch. Uh, I, I don't really play games there. I just live stream coding. And so we work on NeoVim most of the time or NeoVim like adjacent projects like Telescope or other sort of exploratory projects that I'm interested in doing. And then I uh, post stuff on YouTube. Uh, I'll get, I'll send these slides out as a link later and you'll be able to see them. They're just uh, markdown files. So you can see, see these later, the actual links, if you're interested in watching any of those. I did just draw my favorite YouTube video I've ever made uh, where I am sort of giving an introduction on how to use this NeoVim plugin, and I created a Billy Mays uh, inspired infomercial to introduce the plugin. So if that's at all interesting to you, you may enjoy uh, <laughs> my my YouTube. Um, also, as we're going, please feel free to message in the chat and say something. I can see the chat right now, so I should be able to respond or, or stop if you have any questions. Uh, I want it to be interactive, and uh, hopefully I, I'm not the, the only one talking the whole time. So with that, we'll sort of uh, keep on moving through the, the the presentation. So in general, I know everyone's first thought, probably PDE, partial differential equation. No, I, I don't know how you would make any of them into that, but it does seem kind of like an interesting uh, topic. But actually, this is sort of a new term that I'm <clears throat> trying to sort of generally like bring to light because I, I find the situation talking about editors kind of confusing. Now, the reason that I think it's confusing is because most people sort of have this idea of a spectrum between like there's text editors and there's IDEs. And instead of it being a spectrum, most people think of them as just two buckets. And NeoVim gets like put in the text editor bucket along with Vim and like Emacs and Notepad and Nano. And you're like, well, they're not like the same, <laughs> right? There's kind of like a difference between some of those tools and they're good at some things uh, and some of them aren't as good at other things. And so maybe it would be helpful if we had some word that could describe what like NeoVim, Vim and Emacs are. Um, I'll say nice things about Emacs because I think it's a cool project. Um, and, so, and so I think uh, I I'm sort of trying to introduce this idea of a personalized development environment, right? Where it's somewhere in between this idea of a text editor and IDE. And I, I think my checklist will, of course, be a little bit biased because they're all the things that I love about NeoVim. <laughs> uh, but, you know, they're, they're things that I think are a little bit different than an IDE. And they're definitely like very different from a text editor, right? Like NeoVim is very different from like opening up Notepad. So what are the requirements of a PDE? I would say some assembly required. <laughs> um, this is for some people a huge downside. And for some people, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and it's very interesting. I, I like tinkering. I like exploring. I like doing some of those things. So the assembly required isn't like a big negative for me, but some people uh, perfectly reasonably say, I just want to get to like writing the code for my project. I don't want to do this other stuff. And to them, I say, great. If that's what makes you happy, you should do that. Some other requirements sort of generally that I'm saying for what is a PDE it has to be able to do all the coding basics, the things that you expect. Like when you open up code, it has syntax highlighting or it does folding or like it, it just can't be notepad, right? I'm going to keep saying that because I think it makes it clear why it's weird. Like NeoVim gets grouped in to text editors when I think it's something very different. 
I, I think it also needs to have some idea of what it means to have code intelligence. And, and this is basically just understanding that, of course, code is more than just the text that's on the computer, right? There's something semantic about it. There's something more than just letters. And it's important, I think, for a PDE to be able to understand that, whereas like a text editor doesn't have to understand that or provide the tools to create that understanding. And the last bit, this is the bit that I think sort of separates uh, it from an IDE is that PDEs are more focused on things like composition of tools. So I think a lot of this is like Unix philosophy style things, right? Sort of a reuse of an existing tool that works well or an adoption of a specification that people can agree on uh, so that it can be used. And that knowledge that you gain is more than just for that editor, but it's for a larger overall uh, idea. For NeoVim, this is things like, and I'll mention some of these later, but just like using Lua is in my mind, an example of a composition of tools, right? Because it's a great language for embedding inside of a, a C-based project. And so instead of us working really hard on making our own new language, we get to just use a tool that exists. And the last bit, of course, my favorite part, uh, if you know anything about me or if you follow any of my stuff is that I love just scripting and extending uh, NeoVim to do new things. I think those are, those are a core focus. Now, a difference between, uh, obviously like JetBrains has the ability to make plugins and it's really cool. But I think when I say scriptable and extensible here, I mean sort of by like your average end user. My expectation, I, I will admit, I did not find any you know, peer reviewed research about this idea. I didn't get a certified result of survey of percentage of JetBrains users who have written a plugin versus percentage of NeoVim users who have written a plugin, but I feel confident based on my personal experience that the NeoVim users are more likely to write a plugin for their editor versus like JetBrains. So the idea is kind of like it's end user scriptable, end user extensible, not just that it's possible to do those things, but it's sort of a core part and focus of the editor. And so, so these are all things that I think are interesting about NeoVim, things that I like about it. But most importantly for me um, is that NeoVim like I have fun <laughs> being inside of NeoVim. And this is where I, you all asked me to be here. So I feel justified that I can go ahead and go on a rant if I want to. Um, but the, the rant that I want to go on to is that wh when I was a younger lad, I would often try and make the argument that Vim is faster, you know, than other people like editing text at the speed of thought and like the tool gets out of my way and Unix is my IDE and like all these kinds of things. And it's not that I don't uh, believe those things anymore, but I think that they don't work as an argument for people because it, it may not be true for that person. They may not enjoy those aspects of the tool. They may not have fun doing those things. And so they'll never be motivated to like learn to combine those things in that way. And that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Like everybody can have their own different way of editing code and that's okay. We're all different people. <laughs> that should be totally fine. And that's like within our open source ethos, right? That we want people to be able to be sort of like themselves and do those different things. And, and that should be cool. So I've, uh, I, I no longer make any arguments about whether NeoVim is faster or not. And I, I would probably stay with using NeoVim even if I was slower than like, uh, in NeoVim than I was in some other tools because I just have so much fun like erasing those little annoyances in my life or finding a way to make that plugin that just brings a little bit more joy to my life and some other people's life. Those things are fun for me. And uh, I think that's sort of in my mind, you know, since I'm making up the term PDE, that's one of the things that, I, <laughs> that I'm going to add to the requirements of PDE is that you're having fun. Uh, you're having fun using it. So, oh, do I still have my, uh, <laughs> my notifications on for this let me turn that off so that you don't get uh, random notifications from my Twitch stream. Okay, cool. So with all of that out of the way, I just wanted to sort of share, this is some background about the things that when I'm thinking of NeoVim, this is where my headspace is at. It's not just a text editor, it's more than a text editor. So what are some reasons that you uh, might want to use NeoVim, right? Allow me to sell you. The first point is that it's Vim. So if you know Vim, if you're familiar with Vim movements, if you're familiar with those things, NeoVim is a fork of Vim. We still even merge upstream patches and tests and all these other things. So the behavior feels exactly like Vim for so, so many things, more than like any Vim mode is going to be able to do because most of the cases they're running the exact same code that Vim is running. Still got all the help and, 
an existing plugin still works. So if you like Vim, I think it's really low risk um, to sort of like try out NeoVim and see if you like it because a lot of things will just transfer over with no, no differences. Um, and Vim itself, uh, there's a question asking if is Vim development dead? No, Bram is actively working on Vim, making new features. And in fact, he's developing a new language, Vim 9 script that's uh, promising to be much faster than Vim script so that more high performance plugins could be uh, written inside of Vim. And so NeoVim merges a lot of patches though, even now that are coming in from Vim to say like, oh, under this situation, uh, this plugins, uh, like this causes some problem to occur. Okay, let's fix that. And then we'll, we'll merge that patch into NeoVim as well, wherever we can. So a lot of that sort of shared thing is still happening, right? It's not like it just worked in the past and there's been nothing the same. We still try and keep those things going. But on the other hand, uh, another main selling point is that it's not Vim. <laughs> um, so I, I think one of the cool things about NeoVim is we've had this commitment to try and make the experience better for people, even if sometimes that requires um, breaking uh, some aspect of compatibility, some aspect of something that used to be a certain way in the past. So just like simple examples that are easy to explain is like, Okay, we moved where the config goes so that you can follow xdg config home. So like if one thing that just really bothers you is having dot files strewn about your like home directory, okay, well, put it in your xdg config and, and that's where we look for your dot files. We also like change defaults to try and make it better for people opening up NeoVim for the first time with no configuration. And even to the point of changing some default mappings so that they're not so surprising to new users. You don't have to see um, top five Vim mappings that you need to map in your RC, you know, and it's always the same five. And they're all like, well, maybe we should just like put those in. <laughs> if, it, if it makes everybody's life better, maybe we should try and just do that thing, right? So there's sort of this um, commitment and sort of a relentless pursuit of trying to make every aspect of it the, the best that we can be. And, and it's just in a different fashion than what Vim is trying to, to make it be the best, right? Um, this is a quote from the help behaviors, options, documentation are removed. If they cost users more time than they save, this also allows us to iterate faster and focus on the things that people really want, uh, which is exciting. And some other ways that it's not them is, uh, we have different goals. Like I mentioned. So like one, one thing is NeoVim is always built with all the features. There's not a bunch of different builds for Vim. We have a remote API that allows you to control NeoVim. Uh, through another process, through a GUI. Uh, GUIs are just plugins. So uh, every GUI for NeoVim that you see communicates with NeoVim over RPC. And every time we improve RPC for GUIs, we're improving it for plugin authors, we're improving it for users, all these sort of things work, work together. And, and one of my uh, favorite things is that we're using Lua as the primary scripting language for NeoVim. That's, a, I'd say, like 100% buy-in from the team is everybody loves Lua. Everyone's thinking that it's such a great fit for NeoVim. We get a lot of great bonuses from doing this too. I mean, first off is by default, NeoVim ships with LuaJIT and LuaJIT is just like, a, it's just crazy how fast it is. It's unbelievable. As one astute internet author said, it seems like Mike Paul is a robot from the future, right? Uh, that's sort of the idea behind how fast LuaJIT is. And uh, it allows us to do high performance things that we never in the past could have done uh, directly in the editor. So Telescope, plugin that I work as a fuzzy finder written uh, in Lua for NeoVim. And it primar primarily executes just like in the main thread of NeoVim, which allows it a lot of really nice bonus features uh, about not having to worry about sort of all these different conditions that you might um, occur from having a remote plugin. But it's crazy because it's like doing all this filtering, sorting, finding, all just within, uh, within the main thread. And Lua just fast enough to be able to do that. Additionally, we get things like libuv bindings directly. So you can do really high performance, really fast, and even asynchronous if needed operations with the file system or remote sockets or a web server. All these kinds of things just happen for free. And of course, there's existing Lua development happening outside in the world. You can use those, uh, you can use those projects. And there's more people, I think, willing to contribute to learn the language and to get involved with the project. And we've seen that with a lot of our um, larger sort of moonshot projects, like including uh, LSP inside of NeoVim, we've had a lot of contributors. I should have looked up the list before this, but it's a lot, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> so just as an example, like 
it's so easy to work with the API uh, within, within NeoVim to start doing things and just doing the common tasks that you want to do for a buffer. This is just an example of some Lua code. Here you say basically zero means the current buffer. This says over all the lines, kind of like Python style indexing, if you're familiar, right from the zeroth line to the last line. Uh, substitute all of these with just first line, second line. So what's interesting, right, is this is exposed in Lua through vim.api. It's exposed in VimScript with this function and vim buff set lines. And it's exposed over the remote plugins by a message called and the buff set lines. And all of them are the same. So it's sort of this unified way of working within NeoVim, uh, both for GUIs, plugin authors, and users. Uh, and so it provides a really, really standard way to work with NeoVim that at least I find uh, really fun. And the conventions I think are, are really helpful. And as you learn them a little bit, you're able to, I think, iterate very quickly. The other aspect is not only are we using Lua as a scripting language, but we're trying to sort of Luify everything. So settings, key maps, commands, soon auto commands. I think not only is this good in terms of like performance and stuff like that, but also it allows people to not, like a new user doesn't have to learn eight different DSLs for doing the things inside the editor. They're just like regular function calls that you can call with the parameters as described in the help. And you're able to configure the editor much more simply and straightforwardly. And that sort of like onboarding experience is really good uh, for new users, which hopefully there will be some of you in the audience. <laughs> uh, crazy selling point is TreeSitter. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about TreeSitter or not, but it is just a wonderful technology. In short, it's basically a library that allows people to very easily write uh, grammars for a language. And then basically it gets put into this engine and the engine has really great error recovery incremental parsing and a bunch of other um, tools and it allows itself to be embedded in different places. So it's, it's not just for syntax highlighting, but that's the first place people usually hear about it, but it does so much more than that. And I will show you in the live demo at the end uh, because everyone knows that's the best way to embarrass yourself uh, <laughs> for a demo is to go ahead and do that. And uh, what's cool is, right, this is a technology that's getting used in more places than just Vim and NeoVim, right? Like, GitHub is using this to power like a bunch of their highlighting and their code search and other editors are using TreeSitter. So this sort of shared idea and uh, technology is getting improved and we get to reap those rewards without having to do all of that ourselves, which is great because uh, we only have so many contributor hours in a day. And the last one is the built-in LSP. If you're not familiar with LSP, it provides a lot of really great tools like go to definition, find references, rename, help, a bunch of other stuff. And I'll, I'll, I'll I'll show you that in a second, um, working with inside of NeoVim. It's cool because we shipped a client inside of NeoVim. By default, it's there and available for people to use. Um, you still have to install your language servers on your machine. We're not a package manager. We still are just you know, a PDE, right? Um, we're not going to manage everything about your environment for you. You'll still have to install the, the language server itself. But we uh, implement what you need to connect to there. <clears throat> All right, and now we're gonna do a live demo and we're gonna hopefully cover uh, all of these things. <laughs> so before we go on to the live demo, does anyone have any questions about stuff that I've said so far? I, I tr I'm trying to move you know, kind of quickly through there to make sure we have time to do uh, the interesting stuff. Uh, sure, I'm sure what you wanna hear is actually what's going on rather than uh, just what I, what I have to say. So I'll uh, just see if anyone has any questions and then I'll move on. They say you're supposed to wait seven seconds. Can you change syntax highlighting based on version of C++? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure. If there are different tree sitter grammars available for different uh, versions of C++, then I think it would probably be possible. Um, I'm no C++ expert, though, but it, it would be possible to do. Or you could potentially have different um, queries that highlight it differently, depending on uh, what version of C++ you have. Um, I, uh, I mostly uh, I stick to C for NeoVim. <laughs> I, don't, I don't write a lot of C++, so I uh, can't answer that uh, in more detail than that. Are you using TreeSitter for all the syntax highlightings? Do any of your highlighters predate it? So this is a great question. We, there are not TreeSitter grammars for every language. So we have not removed Vim's regex-based syntax highlighting. So for example, if you had your own custom 
syntax highlighting for Vim or whatever, we still use that uh, and, and allow you to use that today if you didn't want to use the tree sitter um, language. Um, but we there is a really large coverage. You can check out uh, nvim tree sitter uh, on GitHub. That's the organization that's doing a lot of the interesting work uh, that's outside of core to sort of make it uh, for users. And then it gets upstreamed eventually into NeoVim core uh, proper where it makes sense. Uh, but there is a really large coverage for language. Every language that I write code in day to day um, has, uh, has a tree sitter grammar. And in fact, they're super easy to make too, which is also one of the really cool things, cool things about it. Okay, I'll just uh, I'll just start with uh, with some of the live demo. Stop me as you go on. Is there a uh, tree sitter grammar for Julia? Probably yes. If I had if I had to guess, uh, the answer would be yes. Uh, but I don't know 100% for sure. We can check. I can look really fast. Let's find out. Oh no! Except uh, for some reason, it could take a long time. Julia, yes, there is. So you can see this is uh, this is the list here of languages, and there's a lot of them. Uh, a lot of them done. So. So, so there you go. So um, let's let's do a live demo. Does this come out of the box with TreeSitter? So NeoVim ships with TreeSitter by default, and it has an engine for TreeSitter. Um, but there are some additional things that you'd need per language. As of right now, a lot of those are available in the NeoVim TreeSitter repo separately that you would install. Um, our goal is someday some of those things would get upstreamed. Um, but we're not, we're not sure how much we're going to do for that. Um, that's still somewhat of an open question. And once again, it's a bit of a assembly required uh, situation for some things, right? So, uh, okay. So I'm just going to open up an example Go file here. Uh, this Go file doesn't have anything too crazy going on. Uh, I've got a few things going on in this file and it's just, it's just a terrible Go file just to show some examples of cool things that we can do with TreeSitter and LSP. So. The first thing I want to show you is uh, this is this is just this is basically a text representation of uh, of what the tree sitter like tree looks like, and so you can see that it's like hey here's a package clause here's the identifier here's an import declaration and here's the different import specs. Tree sitter works by querying this tree, so I can run this query right here. And what's really cool is uh, basically this is a scheme dialect that runs against the tree. I'm not gonna go too detailed into this. Uh, that's a whole talk and a half by itself. But suffice, suffice to say, you can see each of the places where there is an identifier and it's highlighted uh, because of some bonus plugins that happen, but just so that you can see where this query uh, would match. If we instead wanted to look for something like call expression, and I just called it like C or something like that, right? We'll be able to see, um, uh, oh, I didn't spell expression right. There we go. That's why you don't do live demos. You can see where all of the calls happen in this file. Okay, so TreeSitter allows you to run queries against this tree and return basically the subnodes that match, and it lets you do a lot of cool stuff. And so highlighting is actually just basically like queries that run against the tree. They match certain things, and then we display certain colors. So that's how highlighting works. But you can do much more than that. So if you're familiar with Vim, you're probably familiar with the idea of text objects. But if you're not familiar with Vim, I'll just give a brief uh, introduction. Text objects are kind of this idea that you can do Vim motions. So for example, when I press W, I move forward one word. So when I press W, I'm moving forward the word. I can press B to go back. If I type D before I do W, that's delete word, OK? right? Now there's a lot of different kinds of motions that you can do, but one interesting thing is once you start combining tree sitter plus text objects ideas, you can start to do things like DAF will delete around this function. So DAF deletes that function. Now notice that I'm inside of this sort of like nested function inside of this other function. And if I do DAF, I'm just gonna delete that inner function, right? Uh, so you can start to imagine how this sort of idea of textual movement is really cool. I can press a uh, bracket M for move to the next method. And I keep on moving down each time to a new function declaration that is happening through tree sitter, not regexes, which is really cool. You're like kind of moving around based on the tree. But not only that, we can actually start doing things like changing the text based on the tree. So let's say I wanted to move I was like, oh man, I actually want to print this function in the first spot, not this hello. 
I actually have something that can move this parameter to the next spot. Notice how it moved down to the next line and switch places with that function. And I can move it back as well if I want by um, doing this. So I can move that uh, further and further uh, along as we go. So that's tree sitter plus this idea of vim motions that you kind of maybe already are familiar with. But not only is this able to power sort of uh, these movements, it can also power things like selection. A lot of editors have the idea of incremental selection, right? Where you might incrementally select larger scopes of text until you're able to select the whole file. Well, we can do that using tree sitter as well. Uh, another really cool thing is if you sort of know generally where you want to select, um, there's a cool plugin by a friend of mine, Matthias, where you can press um, to enter into basically a selection mode and I can type whatever letter I want here to select this area. So if I wanted to select sort of this whole area here, if I press I, notice how I've now moved up to the beginning of this node and I capture the entire node in that selection. So if I want to delete, delete that so that I could move it down here, we can, we can do all those sorts of cool things. Additionally, this is one of my really favorite things to show about tree sitter. Um, if you're familiar with go, you know that you basically write this, um, if error not equal nil, like at 10,000 times a day, right? And then you do write some return statement here about what you need to do. So a little while ago, I write, I wrote a snippet uh, that actually figures out from tree sitter what the uh, return type is of the current function that you're residing in so that I can type this and it expands to say what each of the different values would be. Um, and you could say like, you know, ret or whatever and call um, example, and then you could move between these and things like that um, as well uh, to keep on jumping between them. Uh, and then you could move between all of these different text locations and it figures out what to fill in for this return value by determining what the types are here and substituting in the default return types for those uh, items. Uh, does it work even an improper program in the buffer? Yeah, yeah. So if we just had something like this, that's like, this is illegal, right? <laughs> like this is illegal to do. Um, let's see. Uh, then we could still do this here and it will still know. It like does its best guess of what the actual contents should be of that file, right? So this is a clearly really busted file. Like you can't just call this at a top level and go, but this still works the rest of the way, right? So I could still do this and hello. Um, uh, hello, that's what I meant to type, sorry. And actually there's even like ways to switch between whether I'm wrapping this or not. I, I wrote this one, you know, and stuff like that. And we can keep on going, right? And so tree sitter works um, to understand the buffer even when there's broken. And yes, is the parser doing work with every keystroke? Yes, one of tree sitter's best attributes is its ability to incrementally parse the tree. Um, yeah, we can try. I don't know for sure if this one will work or not. Um, well, let's say we do VIF. Yep. So that is inside of this function. Or if I do like DAF, it's going to delete still around that, even though we've got this open one here. Basically, tree sitter is trying to guess that what I actually want to do is something else up here entirely. And this is one block down here. So the parser is doing stuff every keystroke. Tree, tree sitter is awesome at incremental stuff. And it's a great fit for text editors. It was made for text editors, actually. So that's, that's why it's awesome. So um, yeah, that's a bunch of the stuff that I wanted to show you for tree sitter, right? That's a bunch of the stuff I wanted to show you for tree sitter. Um, I can show you something else pretty cool as well, where we could do something like, let's say we don't have any errors in this file, right? Uh, we don't use the errors thing at all. And then what I wanted to do was say error uh, equals, whoops, uh, errors. So I have this selection here and notice how uh, I'm getting this idea from LSP. If I select this selection, it uh, adds the errors import up top. And then I could say dot new. It knows that dot new is one of the things from the errors module and gives me the help information for that item. I can select that and I'm inside and I could say hello. If I, uh, right, it doesn't use error, so it's not going to work right now. Uh, because the rest of the file is broken, but that's okay because we just deleted a bunch of random stuff right before this. <laughs> so that's kind of the like, okay, Tree Center can do a lot of stuff. I would not call that like text editor material. There's something in between, <laughs> right, where you're doing that. Um, and then I also wanted to show just a cool example of, of where this can go. 
I've got another project here um, in Rust. Uh, that's why I called it bragging. Uh, Cause if you're going to do a presentation, you obviously want to show that you're using Rust. I mean, <laughs> come on, that's a given, right? So uh, I've got I've got a file here. Um, you'll see some stuff popping up in the corner here. That's actually my LSP telling me, hey, I'm working on getting set up. Okay, I'm ready to go. Um, I, I've got a function here. This is also sort of a nonsensical project just to give you some examples of, of what we can do with Rust. Uh, you'll notice just a couple of things that I'm sure you'll notice right off the bat, this little text here. This is not text that's inside of the buffer. This is virtual text telling me where it's possible that I might run a test or debug a test because we can do that in NeoVim as well. Um, and so let's just let's just show some examples of some of the cool stuff that we can do. And I'll uh, walk you through some of the tech that we're using uh, to do that in between. So the first thing would be, let's put a breakpoint on this line. So you'll notice that I've got this uh, cool, it, well, we were just messing around with different uh, Unicode characters. And this one looks like a silly bee. I know that it's German. Hopefully that's okay. I said it looks like a silly bee. Someone in chat told me it was fine to say. So um, so I, this is where I've added a breakpoint to this uh, to this spot. I've written some stuff that integrates a bit with Cargo. But in general, this is just a combination of LSP plus Cargo tools. So this idea of composing these together, I can say, Hey, uh, what can I run inside of this file? I ask the LSP what I could possibly run. The LSP says, hey, you can run bragging, right? Because that's what I named my module because it's Rust. Or we can run some of the tests. Um, so I'd like to run the one that's a failure uh, so that I can show what's going on there. When I press Enter, that opens up uh, my UI for debugging. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to make the text slightly smaller so that you can see generally a little bit more what's going on because otherwise I think it's too confusing. Normally I have my text much smaller, but for presentations, I like to keep it a little bit bigger. Um, and we can do just like what you'd expect from a normal uh, debugger. We can step into this function and we can see what's happening. We can see that we're returning from this buffer. And now we see that X has been set to five. And if I was debugging this and I saw a function named kind of double, uh, but it didn't double my thing, that's where I would start getting suspicious. <laughs> And that helps me find out what's going wrong, right? So I can see that expected equals six, just like I said. And then we return and we notice that that is busted and we get the failure message from Cargo that you would get if you would run Cargo test uh, manually for yourself. And then uh, once we're done with looking at that info, we can be done. LSP allows us to do really cool things like I'm on top of this identifier. I can go to that definition. That would work across files or projects, assuming that your LSP is set up correctly. We can do cool stuff like uh, make a new name. So this could be uh, like, we could just change it to definitely not double. And sure enough, it changes definitely not double. And it changes it in each of these different locations. Um, right? I can even show like, let's say we change this to be um, val, right? So now we've got two things in the buffer named val. Normally, if you were just doing something like percent %s val other thing, oh, dang. I just changed this val as well up here. That's not good. And that's not what we want to do. So instead of doing that, if I say let's uh, still x instead of val, notice that LSP understands the code at more than just a textual level, right? There's something going on there that's more than just text. So it does what you expect from IDE rename, right? And that it, it only renames the things that make sense. Now it works for functions and depending on your LSP will work across your whole uh, project as well. So that's sort of uh, LSP, tree sitter, and debugging. Um, those are some of the main things that I wanted to show. There's just a few other cool things, um, cool things to go over. Ah, so someone asked, how would debugging work with C? Does it use something like GDB under the covers? So the plugin that I'm using right now is called NVIM DAP, uh, Debug Adapter Protocol. Very similar in concept to LSP. Um, and basically there is, I'm pretty sure, um, a debug adapter for GDB. So you could, uh, you could just use the same sort of setup within. There's also some stuff built into Vim called term debug. I don't have time to go over that today, but it is possible to debug some C-like languages uh, more natively, uh, but it's a topic that's a, a bit more complicated, but it is possible to do. Um, I just wanna show a few sort of, uh, I'll call them goodies. 
uh, because I like them a lot. Some of these are with Telescope, the fuzzy finder library that um, I created and help maintain now. Um, we've got a lot of really awesome contributors who've done a ton of work. So it's definitely not all me, uh, but I, I was the, I, I did uh, help make it at least. So I can, I can say that. So what if you wanted to do something like, I want to figure out what symbols are in this file and navigate to there. Well, we have this thing called document symbols. It's an LSP request. You can actually see um, that this has the name, what type the thing is, and then some sort of uh, text from the line that that's on. And we can show a preview for each of those things and highlight where they are. This is all sort of telescope plus built-in LSP. You get a bunch of these things for free if you're using LSP and telescope uh, because they compose together well. So the idea of composability extends not only between other tools, but is sort of a general ethos of a lot of the people in the NeoVim ecosystem of trying to play super nice uh, together. So we get this idea of document symbols. I could start typing something like fail and it'll filter down to only the one that says fail and we can move to that file. This could work uh, across your project as well, depending on your LSP's capabilities. Um, and it does a lot of other cool stuff too. Like if we had more things inside of here, you might want to filter down to only functions. It allows passing tags and doing other cool stuff that interoperates with, with the LSP. We also have stuff like um, finding all of your files in a Git folder. Now I'm inside of my large config folder. So I have a lot of different files inside of here, um, MD files and everything, as well as fuzzy finding the files in your directory under this. This is like Vim tags with a bunch Yes, it's very similar in principle in a lot of ways to uh, Vim tags. Uh, and some of the stuff integrates kind of with the tag stack as well. So if you press uh, go to definition, you can press control T to jump up the tag stack um, because we try to still use as many Vim isms as we can, even in some of the new features that uh, we're creating. You can even do stuff like uh, this is live grep is what, we, is what I call it. And you can start typing things like um, just like you're grepping and see the results live of what's being typed. So if you look for all the places I type let here, I can see what the results of those are. That uses rip grep under the hood to do the searching. Uh, we didn't re-implement <laughs> what grepping is, right? We just use some other tool and compose it inside to combine with a telescope and the oven so that you can see what's, uh, what's going on there. So that's kind of, that's, that's all the like live demo that I had planned. I wanted to try and cover all of those sort of as quickly as I could go over them just to give you a taste of all the different kinds of things that we can do inside of NeoVim. And now I'm happy to answer any different questions you have. So feel free to shoot them in the chat or ask them uh, out loud, it's fine too. Um, I see that there's a plugin for XML. Can that be used to validate against the schema and highlights? Um, I'm not sure. There's probably some stuff that can do that. I'm not super familiar with uh, the plugin that you're mentioning, but I imagine there is a way to validate the schema. Yeah, definitely highlight. What um, plugin installer do you use? Is, does NeoVim have an opinion about what type of installer to use, Vim plug or, or whatever? Uh, NeoVim does not have any opinions about which one you should use. I use a, a a uh, plugin installer called Packer. Um, it uh, does some interesting things uh, in addition to normal uh, package management, including the ability to uh, install some Lua packages from Lua rocks, which is really interesting. So if there's some Lua package that exists out in the wild, uh, well, if it's written in Lua, <laughs> we can execute that code. So you could reuse uh, some code that other people have written, which is exciting for thinking about uh, not having to rewrite everything just to work inside your editor. Very cool uh, presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, does the functionality you showed come pre-configured? If not, what's the process for setting up a particular language? So uh, obviously not like everything I showed here today is uh, pre-configured, but actually a lot of it is, is relatively simple to set up. Um, obviously some of like my custom customized snippets or things like that are not, are not available, but um, for example, if you wanted to just, uh, if you wanted to set up like LSP, it, it goes mostly like this. You install um, a plugin called LSP config that makes it so that you don't have to know some like weird command line configuration to start a language server. It just basically is a collection of configuration items. 
So assuming you've installed that, you could just say like local LSP config is require LSP config, LSP config dot uh, rust analyzer dot setup. And then you can say on attach is a function here. This function gets called when you attach to a particular buffer. And then after reading a little bit of help or the wiki documentation on how to set up a thing, you'll know that you can just basically do um, vim dot uh, keymap, oops, sorry, keymap dot set normal mode GD for go to definition, vim dot LSP dot buff dot definition like this. And you can just sort of start extending this. Uh, you can look at the help for a bunch of these things to know what they're doing, right? But after you do this once, so configuration for you, assembly uh, required, right? Then to add a new language, um, you could just say custom attach here, local custom attach is this function. And then you could say to add a new language, all you would have to do is say, uh, go please or something dot setup on attach equals custom attach like this. So like once you have one language set up, the cool thing is all these languages and all of these other things use the same general like framework, I guess. I don't really like to say framework because it makes it sound like it's some monstrous, uh, <laughs> some monstrous thing. But once you have one language set up, you can pretty much just copy your configuration between the different languages or like just put it into one function. And then those languages will be attached for other things. Um, so my project has several developer machines after I've customized my NeoVim uh, PDE, how do I copy it over to other machines? In general, um, I recommend just having some of your dot files be uh, GitHub or some Git repo that you have and that you're able to sync. And uh, so for example, my, uh, my dot files are just in, oops, uh, here. This is just like a normal folder with all files that you can read because they are just files that get executed. So if you commit that and push and pull on another machine, all you have to do is run whatever your like plugin installer uh, tells you to do. So for me, that's Packer Sync. So once I run Packer Sync after I've got my new uh, Git files down, then I'm all set to go. Same experience on both machines. Um, assuming that, you know, I have like NeoVim running and stuff already on that computer, obviously it doesn't like magically install uh, everything, but yeah. Does that make sense? It, they're just files uh, <laughs> that get executed. There's nothing special about them, right? So like my init.lua, the file that gets executed when we start is just like a Lua file that gets executed. There's no like weird binary or like XML that you have to hope doesn't change between versions or something like that. Um, yeah, you just have, just have files. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's why I, that's why I mentioned that because I know I have, uh, I, I, I have used JetBrains at various times in my life and I, I really like JetBrains in a lot of ways, but like getting my JetBrains set up the same way between two machines was just not, a possibility, it seemed for me. <laughs> I could never get it to actually work. Um, so yeah, so you just can literally, uh, it's just files. You can just commit them. Um, I have, like here is my repo that has not only my dot files for any of them, but all my other dot files as well. And so you can just see inside of here, I've got a folder here with like a lot of lines of code. You don't need this many lines of code to get working. <laughs> Um, but remember, part of the fun for me is just getting to tinker and write more code. So I have, uh, I have definitely done that uh, many times. <laughs> uh, how does the RPC stuff work over a network? Can I edit locally and push changes to the remote or X11 tunnel back? So the RPC uh, is, I think that's a little bit different. You could, for example, edit our remote files using like SSHFS or... Um, some other plugins to do that. The RPC is generally like local over some socket between you and like a GUI or something like that. Um, I, I, the, the RPC is mostly between like NeoVim and plugins. It's not really between you and NeoVim, if that makes sense. I don't, I don't know if I'm 100% uh, understanding the question though. Cool. <laughs> 